Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm Ryan Mauser back once again, and it was a busy, busy day in the NBA. As we had the NBA trade, trade deadline come and go, and boy, was there a lot, a lot of moves that went on. Started early. We we had the Magic getting busy and shipping off some big players, some teams making improvements, obviously, or hoping to make improvements. And so I want to take a look and kind of go through all the trades that went down today, some moves that didn't happen, who got better, who maybe should have made a move and didn't. So again, it was a busy day in the NBA and one of the most fun days of the year always in any sport. I'd say the the trade deadline is one of those days that you kind of have marked on your calendars and you're always on the lookout for and it, it kind of hypes up that, that day of when it's when you're watching the clock tick or it's oh, there's only a little bit more time left in the trade deadline day. And the deadline comes and it hits and you're waiting for team your team to make a move. Now, obviously, trades do come in a little bit after the official deadline time. It's just the way that the paperwork gets filed or that the call is going. It, it's it's that little league legality of, yeah, this is the official trade deadline time. But also, you still get trades coming in and being notified after after the quote-unquote deadline. So... Some deals did go down that were were a little bit shocking, and then some moves that you were anticipating that didn't happen, so we'll focus on those. But I wanted to start with the, the Magic, who were big-time sellers this deadline. Obviously, it's been not the season that the Magic were hoping for. They had some injuries. Uh, Jonathan Isaac, who's out for the year after tearing his ACL in the bubble, so for the Magic, it was it was a sell mode. It was, okay, they have some young pieces. Markel Fultz, who tore his ACL at the beginning of this season, and it kind of forced them to re-advert their, their ideas and their plan for competing this year, or at least competing in the East this season. So what the Magic decided to do was to sell off some big some big pieces, um, some guys who can help contribute to some playoff teams or hopeful playoff teams in certain cases. And so star player Nikolai Vucevic was dealt to the Chicago Bulls in a in a, a, a caught me a little bit by surprise. I know I had heard Vucevic's, Vucevic's name rumored to be a, uh, being shopped, so that wasn't the surprising part. But the Bulls stepping up and actually acquiring the services of him and giving up Wendell Carter Jr., who, being a young piece going back to Orlando, you can see kind of what their plan is. Pair him with Markel Foltz, Jonathan Isaac, and hopefully build uh, towards the future and, and going towards that. They also got Otto Porter Jr., who uh, on a, a few podcasts ago I mentioned as someone that you could see some champion or some not championship teams, but t- playoff teams maybe targeting and going for. There's also the, the, the buyout market that... I'm assuming the Magic buy him out. I, I don't anticipate him playing for the Magic too much, or if ever, we'll, we'll see the buyout market start to unfold, as it already has begun a bit with LaMarcus Aldridge and the Spurs agreeing to a buyout. But you look at this deal and the the Magic getting some uh, getting Wendell Carter Jr., which that's obviously the big piece in the deal for them, and, and a couple first-round picks. But look at the look. Let's look at the Bulls, who they're a team that right now they sit in the tenth spot, so they're right at the uh, 
edge of that playing tournament, but again, they're not very far out from it, as, as all teams in the East, aside from the top three. There's that bunch from 4 to 10 to where it's only a couple games swings, and we can see a lot of movement happen. I mean, we got Boston, who surprisingly sits at 8, and they were rumored to be going after Nikola Vucevic and didn't pull the trigger. Now they did make a move for a Magic player, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But the Bulls, it's showing that they, they're saying that they want to they wanna compete right now. I mean, you're pairing Vucevic with Zach Levine, Colby White, Laurie Markkinen, who we weren't sure if Markkinen would get moved or not. Obviously, they held on to him. So for the Bulls, I, I do like the move. You get a, a star player to pair with your franchise star. And so you're looking forward and you're looking, thinking, all right, well, we can make a we can make a run at this and, and maybe make some noise in the East. And also, Chicago ended up on another deal getting Daniel Tice. So you have your... You have a starting center in Vucevic, and you're getting a backup in Daniel Tice. So I, I do, and I do like the move for the for the Bulls. It's trying to make your franchise player happy. He obviously Zach Levine wants to win and doesn't want to miss the playoffs yet again. You have to show him something that says, you know what, we, we are we are buying into you. We're not just punting on the season and going that we that we hey we don't really have any plans right now for you. So I do like the move. It's it could get complicated in a little bit with Zach Levine when when he has free agency up and whether it it worked out with Vucevic or not. But they do have a young core that you can go. Okay, well, if this team is able to string in string off, let's say a eight and two stretch in ten games and kind of elevate their stock and their playoff uh, positioning. It could be really good for get be really good for the Bulls and moving forward and kind of get them back in the right direction. They ha- would have still young pieces. I mean, Vucevic is only twenty seven, I believe, and Zach Levine is still only twenty five. So they still have a young group, and even give, get, getting away from Otto. Or, excuse me, Otto Porter is not young, but Wendell Carter Jr., who it didn't quite work out the way they had hoped with with uh, Wendell, and he had dealt with some injuries also, and it just it didn't seem like the fit was there. Now you're bringing in Vucevic, and it, it, it will spread the floor a bit more, open up some lanes. He can do, he, I mean, he's one of the most talented big men. Uh, he's 30, excuse me, I said 27, but 30, so it's still, it's still youngish, so it's not, it's not a, oh, we're going all in this season. But it's a move to where you go. Okay, well they want to they want to at least show and make some improvements for it, and and know that hey, if you're proven to your star player, look, we we want to win with you. We, we we have goals in mind, and let's make it happen. So you go get him that piece, and so I'm, I'm I am intrigued by the Bulls, and again they are in that ten seed, so that the last spot for the play-in tournament. And so they let it be known that they're, they're going to try and make a little bit of a run and maybe su- surprise some people. The East is very, very open this season uh, besides the top three. Four through ten, you're going to see a lot of shuffling going on. So I, I do do like what the Bulls did. For the Magic, it's a great move in the sense that, hey, you're bringing in Wendell Carter Jr., who is very young piece. You're getting two first-round picks also on top of it. So... Why not do it? I mean, it's a 2021 first, and that's top four protected. And then a 2023 uh, first-round pick. So it's looking most likely that 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 2021 pick this season will be outside of the top four, you'd imagine. So that's good for the Magic in in a deep deep top of the draft boards. The Magic are positioning themselves well to have maybe two in the top ten. So... You like it for a Magic team that's truly building for the future and was not going anywhere this season. Obviously, by the way that they sit at 15 and 29, moving off Vucevic and then also moving off Aaron Gordon. And we had heard Aaron Gordon requested his trade from the Magic and he didn't want to be there anymore. It was kind of, it had run its course and it was about time for a change. He he it, He didn't necessarily work out the way that they might have hoped, and he never really seemed to reach his full potential. And so trading him to the Nuggets, who 
this will help the Nuggets definitely bringing in another star player and getting and pairing him with uh, Jokic and Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. My only question is, what do you do with Paul Millsap? That's where I'm looking at, and he would move to the bench, so that's not a bad bench piece anymore. But Aaron Gordon should help on the defensive side for the Magic or for the Nuggets, excuse me. With the fact that you you don't get a ton of defense from Michael Porter Jr. and Jokic when they're out there together, you put him in there now, and it's gonna it's gonna shore up some things on the defensive side of the ball. And we know how athletic Gordon is, and having that next day. That explosive player paired out with Jokic, who's one of the best passers in the league. He'll be able to find Gordon for some cutting dunks. And it's going to be Denver's really going for it this year. Den- Denver sees they need to make a move. They're sitting right in that that five spot or uh, after the loss last night. They're they're sitting in the yeah, still in the five spot, uh, half a game up on Portland, which if you're in that top six seeds, you stay out of the play-in tournament. And in the West, that's huge. Because unlike the East, where it's anybody is going to win four through ten, the West, if you're out of that play-in tournament, that's much better because it's going to be so much tougher of games. You don't want to run into a a Warriors squad or a Dallas Mavericks in a play-in game type scenario. So definitely making sure to stay out of that range is important. And so the Nuggets are showing, hey, maybe they think that the Lakers are a little bit vulnerable. We saw that the Nuggets made it to the Western Conference Finals last season, and they want to build off that. You can't really sell to your fans that you regress. That's 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 a tough, that's a tough one to sell, especially when you have a s- couple superstar players in Jamal Murray and Nikola uh, you, Nikola Jokic. So it, it's a, it's a good move for the Nuggets. You get uh, a young, high flying, athletic uh, forward. So I do like the move for them. They didn't have to give up too much the moving off of RJ Hampton is one of those where they did trade a first round pick to get him so I don't like trading him away but also you you don't know what you have in him yet he's coming from the Australian league he did it he went the route of going the professional route instead of college he was a highly touted prospect uh leading up to his draft though so for the magic again you're looking at it you're going they're getting high upside of potentially getting a steal in R.J. Hampton, but also Gary Harris can help and play some in the backcourt for them. It's not going to be a move where Gary Harris is going to change the the culture of the Magic or anything, but you get a you get a piece who can come in, be productive, play his play his role, and you got younger and you got some young pieces, and in doing so, you also got a 2025 first round pick down the line. So you'll you'll see what happens. Obviously, the Nuggets are anticipating that not being too much, but it is top five protected. So the Magic were really the biggest sellers of the day. They also sent Evan Fournier to the Boston Celtics, who the Boston Celtics were in a much-needed spot of trying to find something else. Their their team, again, like I was saying earlier, they're sitting in the eighth seed and Boston is way too talented to be sitting in the eighth seed. That that's their fans should be looking at that. That that's unacceptable. And I get it. It's it's been a weird year. It's been a bit challenging for them. They've had some some things not necessarily go right. And they're only they're only a game a game away from being the five seed and a game and a half away from being the four seed. So it's not like they're that far off. But again, the fact that on this on March 25th right now, Boston sits 21 and 23 and in eighth spot, the last play they last less playoff spot in the East, but also would be a part of the playing tournament is unacceptable. You have Jalen Brown, you have Kemba Walker, you have Jason Tatum, and you have Brad Stevens as your coach. You should be playing with the big dogs like the Sixers, the Bucks and the Nets, not hanging around the Hawks, Knicks and Hornets. It's Boston, I referenced it on a pod in the past that it was something was wrong with in Boston. Something wasn't working. There was issues going on, and it just Marcus Smart was out at the time. He's back now. They had a tough loss yesterday versus the Bucks. Um, they did rally from being down twenty five in the third quarter. 
and did cost me my bet, which was not fun. But besides that point, yeah, it was. It's it's been a tough season for Boston, and you gotta wonder what will what will Evan Fournier bring? It's a it's a sniper. I mean, Fournier has played pretty well this season. He's gonna be he's gonna be hitting some big shots for them. And again, they did not give up a lot for him. It was kind of surprising that that was all that they gave up was Jeff Teague and two second round picks for Evan Fournier. Uh, it, it seemed that the Magic were just in full sell mode and were comfortable just giving up and shedding some salary and moving off. But for Evan, for giving up Evan Fournier and, and you only had to give up Jeff Teague, who hasn't been doing anything really for uh, the boss for the Celtics. And only two second round picks who you can punt that away easily. I mean, Fournier is averaging 19.7 points a game. He's shooting 38% from three and 46 from the field. That's an immediate boost to Boston. Now you don't anticipate Fournier is going to be starting with them or with that lineup. I don't. He's probably not on most nights. There will be sometimes, but most nights he's not going to be your closing lineup. It's You got Marcus Smart. You have Kemba, you have Jalen Brown, you have Jason Tatum, and you're going to play probably Tristan Thompson at, at center. And now that they moved off of Tice, which I was a little surprised about that, just Daniel Tice had been a pretty solid piece for them throughout the season, and he seemed to be well-liked on the team. But again, it's it's a business, and the Celtics made a move that they thought was really needed. For the Magic, though, you you got to wonder why didn't they get a little bit more in return I mean, considering that they were fully giving away Fusevic and Aaron Gordon, they seem to settle on give, what they got in return for Evan Fournier. It's an expiring contract, and it was a little bit lackluster of a of a haul back. But for the Boston Celtics, great job. Danny Ainge made a move. We, everyone kind of wondered when would Danny Ainge make his mark and and make a splash move. And this isn't the splashiest moves that he usually is in the mix for. I, he, we always hear the Boston Celtics are in on every big star. They wanted to trade for Anthony Davis. They want to trade for Ka- Ka- Kawhi Leonard. They traded for Kyrie Irving. It's it's what Boston does. I mean, they made the move to go get Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen to form that big three back in the early. Uh, early eh, mid 2000s and so you go okay the Celtics are always and Danny Ainge is always on the look to make improvements the problem with the Celtics in the past has been they've been hesitant to make moves they were always looking I was talking to a buddy earlier today and I was saying it's Danny Ainge always wants to be the winner of the deal he always wants to make sure that he won you look at what they did with the Brooklyn Nets trading away Paul Pierce Jason Terry and Kevin Garnett, and getting back that crazy amount of picks, and that haul that ended up netting them Jason Tatum. So you look at it, go, and okay, at a certain point, teams don't want to constantly be getting taken advantage of, and and being known that oh, you got swindled by Danny Ainge again. So it's it seemed like he he did get the better of the Magic once again, or not them once again, but a team once again. Now, for the Magic, you go, okay, well, maybe they just felt, all right, we can move off Evan Fournier. We're not getting better offers for him. We'll take what we can get. But in the sense that you only got two seconds and Jeff Teague, who Jeff Teague's not going to move the needle for you at all and really do a ton for a Magic team, it's it helps them in trying to get a higher pick this year. And then, again, in that deep, top-heavy part of the draft, I guess good for them that they were able to at least get some more stuff in the their other deals. But yeah, for Evan Fournier, who, again, shooting 38% from three, every team can use that. It's it's <laughs> it's interesting. So we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens. Uh, Magic are looking like they're going to be bottom feeders for the rest of the season and even more so. And so we'll see what happens. And hopefully for them that they're able to draft a young stud in this uh, this upcoming draft and pair him with their young guys who they have and Markel Fultz is able to come back healthy and Jonathan Isaac's able to come back healthy and Wendell Carter Jr. gets comfortable with the magic so we'll see because it's been uh Orlando did make the playoffs two years ago they were part of the bubble last year so it's 
we'll see what happens. We'll see see what goes on. And so the Magic made moves early on in the day. They were the they were the big uh, sellers of the day. No team sold like them, but they were definitely early on and getting moves done and making stuff happen and kind of kind of kicking off the trade deadline season. And yeah, so it was it was a pretty interesting morning for the Magic. Congrats to the Celtics, the Nuggets, and the Bulls. We'll see what happens. And two of those teams are in the East, and two of them are going to be fighting each other. So we'll see who got the better end and who it helps more. Um, I'm going to take a quick break right here. Then we'll get back into some of the other trades that went on today, talk about some of the some of the other deals. And then at the back half of the episode, I do want to get into some teams that didn't make moves that I was a little surprised weren't either buyers or weren't sellers. So we'll get that all coming up. It's the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So I was talking about the Magic, who were big-time sellers on the day and kind of kicked off the trading, uh, the trades of the day before the trade deadline. Uh, Terrence Rouse was probably the funniest player of the day. He had some uh, good tweets in regards to his teammates being shipped off. He had, uh, I'm the captain now. That one got me laughing. And then he's realizing now he's the oldest player in the locker room, so... He said, life comes at you fast. Good job, Terrence. We have, we have a sense of humor on this day. I, I, You feel for players in the fact that their their lives are kind of changing. They're, they're going to a new city, new teammates, new environment, new everything. They have to learn a new system. And you're leaving some guys who have played in places for their entire career, like Aaron Gordon, who has been a magic his entire career. Vucevic, same situation. But some guys, it's a fresh start. Some people are excited. I think it's just that nervous energy. Uh, I saw CJ McCollum tweeting out he wasn't sure if, if it's a good a good idea to take a nap on the day because you wake up and the landscape of the NBA has changed. And speaking of uh, CJ in Portland, a move that they made that I I'm torn about because I really really like this player and I think that the Portland did a good job in who they got back for him. But yeah, it, it's uh, Gary Trent Jr. Being sent to Toronto along with Rodney Hood, who that's not the big move, for Norman Powell from the Raptors, and I, I really, I had Gary Trent Jr. If he, I, I don't know if he qualified exactly because he does play a lot of minutes, um, but he, I was looking at him as a six man of the year who he stepped up when 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 CJ McCollum went down with his his foot fracture. Gary Trent Jr. was a man who who really shouldered a lot of the load for the Portland Trailblazers. And obviously I've talked about how much Damian Lillard has done and the fact that he should be right now with everyone hurt and people going down. And even if people weren't hurt, he should still be an MVP discussion. But I think he's the MVP favorite, um, especially with Embiid and LeBron now out for extended amount of time. But Gary Trent Jr., who averaged 15 points game uh, this season, shooting 39% from three and 41 from the field. I just, he he seemed to always hit big-time shots for them. He was just a knockdown shooter and, and really consistent for me. But I get it. It's with CJ back. It's it's tough because you want 
to continue to give Gary Trent minutes, but at the same time, you can't play him, CJ, and Dame all out there together. You're just there's no size, there's no defense. You're not you're not getting that same it impact that he was when CJ was out. So they they felt that they had to make a move. Uh, obviously, you're looking at this Portland Trailblazers team who sits in uh, sixth place right now. And they are half a game back of the Nuggets for that fifth spot. And again, that sixth seed is very important because that keeps you out of the play-in tournament. And nobody, none of these teams want to be in the play-in tournament unless if if you actually have title aspirations. Now, if you're a team who is a young up-and-coming team, being part of the play-in tournament is all that you really are hoping for. So that way, it's... It's important for them to make a move that helps them stay out of that and get Norman Powell, who's averaging 19.6 points per game, and he's shooting 43.9% from the three and 49% from from the field goal. He's going to add some more on defense. He's going to be able to move. Uh, He's a good cutter getting after the basket. He's he's a hard-nosed player. So for Portland, as much as it sucks moving on from Gary Trent Jr., and bringing in Norman Powell, it's 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 a good move. It's it's going to help them out. But yeah, I was I I find it tough to move off of Gary Trent Jr. Who say what you want about his recent slump had played really really well for Portland and. So you hope now that he's in Toronto, he'll get his chance to shine very much and and put up some big numbers. Him, Fred Van Vliet, and Siakam. And we'll get to what Toronto didn't do a bit later, which caught me by surprise. But they did make a move. And they had a, another minor move, which wasn't much. Uh, Terrence Davis getting traded from the Raptors. So they did they did make some moves, but nothing... Nothing major in that, just getting a, a second-round pick for Terrence Davis. We also had another team that is jockeying for getting a higher seed or at least locking up a top three seed. We were wondering what the Clippers would be doing because we knew that they were looking to move off Lou Will. That that had been the case for a, since the stories kind of had come out in the off season about what was going on with the unhappiness about the Kawhi Leonard about Kawhi Leonard and Paul George situation, and so they were able to figure out a move, and they dealt Lou Will and they brought him Rajon Rondo, but along with Lou Will. They sent a 2023 second round pick and 2027 second round pick, which those don't necessarily really going to factor in too much. But bringing in Rajon Rondo, so this team, it's you looked at the Clippers and I thought maybe Kyle Lowry, although the money didn't necessarily fit there. He Kyle Lowry's getting paid thirty four million dollars, so it would have been tough. Maybe you pair. Luke Kennard and someone else and, and try and bring him in. But it, I felt that the the Clippers needed a, a, a true point guard to help run the offense and to get everyone involved and to handle things. So bringing in Rajon Rondo, who has dealt with injuries this season and hasn't necessarily been on the floor a ton for the Hawks, who the Hawks have gotten pretty hot recently and it it's seemed like he wasn't necessarily playing all that much with them. But you look at it and you go, okay, well, the Clippers now get a, a true point guard in Rondo, but he's, he's not the youngest guy, so it's it's a it's a move for now. And granted, Lou Will's not a young guy in any means, and that's not going to bring you back uh, mortgaging your future by moving off of Lou Will. It's but you 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 get Kawhi Leonard and, and Paul George, a, a proven winner, to help because obviously the Clippers need to shake off what happened last year and blow him the 3-1 lead and what the eruption that kind of went on with that team and what it sounded like happened behind the scenes Doc Rivers getting fired there's a bad taste in in Clipper, Clipperland and they haven't been 
the smoothest team this season. Now, granted, they are still in that three seed, 29-16 and 16 right now, half a game up on the Lakers, and uh, three games up away from that sixth spot and even four and a half games up away from the seventh spot. So they're not near being in the play-in tournament, and as long as you have Kawhi and Paul George healthy, you should be fine and avoid that. But you wonder, okay, so what what does this move do to them? Is this the the changing piece that they really needed that it, it helps them be better? Is, is is this an upgrade? I Rondo can't shoot, which I mean the team has a decent enough amount of shooting in Paul George, Kawhi, Luke Kennard when he goes off and Nicholas Batum has played well for them and that that's been an actually pretty solid pickup for them. Was Rondo the right answer? I I don't say it it's a bad option, but again I would have liked to see a little bit more of a a shooting point guard maybe helping them out uh, cuz you're not going to get any shooting from Patrick Beverly when he's out there. I Rondo's not going to give you much. It's You're going to rely a little bit more on Luke Kennard. Terrence Mann might get a bigger role now moving forward. So we'll see what happens. I, I, I definitely thought that the Clippers would make a move, maybe bring in someone and add something to it. Was Rajon Rondo the answer? That that one was not it for me. But you got to give it to them. They're, they're trying something. We'll see what happens. Lou Will gets to go home to Atlanta, gets kind of off the... Off the Clippers, where it seemed like there is a bit of a sour fuel, and he brings in a, a big time athletic veteran presence to the Hawks. Who again, the, the Hawks have since firing Lloyd Pierce, which I was a little surprised about, but it turns out has worked out fantastic for them as they've won eight of their last ten, losing last night to the Kings in uh, by two points. But again, uh, up to that point, they had won eight out of nine, and so eight out of ten games. The Hawks are right there, and, and the Hawks sit. They were just in, and again, talking about the craziness of the East. The Hawks were just last night at the four seed, and then with the loss, dropped all the way to the seven seed. So you're going to see a lot, a lot of movement going on in that East because everyone's so bunch tight, and it's so close in games, and there's going to be flip-flopping happening all the time from this point moving forward for the rest of the season. Dallas Mavericks made a move that I do like it. I do like the move. It doesn't necessarily help their defense, which has been a problem. But getting JJ Redick and having him be the shooter that will help spread the floor for Luca is I do like it. And Nicolo Nicolo Melli also, who can shoot the ball, and only giving up James Johnson, West Awandu, and a twenty twenty one second round pick. I look at Dallas and I go, okay, Dallas got better. They added a a guy who knows the playoffs extremely well. I mean, in his entire career, I think J.J. Redick has only missed the playoffs once, and that was last year. So it's it's a, it's a good move for the Mavs, adding a guy who, who's been there, done that, can provide three-point shooting from you. And so he's a career 41 three-point shooter, so it's going to help spread the floor, and that's what you need if you're the Mavericks. And you have Luka, you have... Chris Stapps Porzingis, you're sitting in that seven spot right now. And like I've said so much on this episode, you want to get to that six spot, six or higher, because you don't want to be in the play-in tournament. And so adding some much-needed shooting to your squad in a guy who has been in the playoffs 14 out of 15 seasons, 41% three-point shooter, it's only going to benefit you going forward and having that presence in the locker room and, and being a leader, I think I think the move is a solid one for J.J. Redick. For the Pelicans, they're able to kind of move off uh, J.J., who it, it wasn't necessarily working out for them. He was a bit banged up with them, and it, it didn't quite pan out the way they had hoped. Again, he is a floor spacer, but you can them moving off maybe allows even more minutes for Josh Hart. Brandon Ingram's going to be the ball guy, ball control, uh, ball handler, excuse me. I thought maybe they would try and move off of Steven Adams also, although Steven Adams ends up staying with the Pelicans and not going anywhere. And 
they're still looking at it and saying, okay, they they have they have a shot at getting into that playing tournament. They're sitting at that 11 spot, which is you're one spot away from being involved in the tournament. So anything can happen. The Pelicans could go on a little bit of a run and get themselves in there. But yeah, for the Pels, you go, okay, it's, they had been rumored to be looking on, to move off of J.J. Redick. I know I had heard that they were even possibly going to do a buyout situation, which if you would have if you would have bought him out, there would have been a lot of teams looking for his services. So at least they got something in return. And then one of the later moves that happened that was a, a, a big move that was kind of expected, but towards the end of the, the afternoon as we were winding down the clock and getting close to the deadline, you thought maybe he ends up staying put, was the Houston Rockets traded Victor Oladipo to the Miami Heat for Avery Bradley, Kelly Olynyk, and 2022... First round swap swap pick rights, so whatever pick is higher, the Rockets will get between those two. Whew, tough, tough, tough. The Rockets, who got Victor Oladipo as part of the James Harden move, yeah, it's you got you got a feel for the franchise. I, I kind of want to get into that a little bit right here. Is James Harden kind of screwed the Rockets. I mean, he let it be known that he wanted to be traded, kind of sunk his trade value. It was, at that point, up for the Rockets just to get whatever they could could b- get back. And they could have had Karis LeVert, could have had Jared Allen, which both of those I think would have been a better move than Victor Oladipo for the sheer fact that Oladipo did not want to be in Houston. He turned down any trade extension or uh, excuse me contract extension that they offered he wasn't the same guy since he came was coming back from his injuries I mean he was dealing with a quad he had the torn ACL that he was uh, also had come back from last year he's going he's going to be a free agent coming up so it's not like there is a ton of value in that guy because you don't know if he was going to leave or not so for the Rockets it's brutal. I mean, you get one of the pieces you got back for your franchise player. You just had to trade. Karis LeVert, Jared Allen are being productive for their teams in Cleveland and Indiana after Karis LeVert, thankfully, was got healthy and got uh, his medicals uh, worked out. But for the Rockets, you you can't blame them at all too much for it because of the fact that you go, okay, well... James Harden kind of kind of left you high and dry telling everyone, "Hey, I'm 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 not showing up. I'm not going to play really. I'm going to be out of shape and I want to be traded." And it was tough. They 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 thought they did what they thought was the best move and getting the best pieces that they could for a asset that didn't want to be there, that let it be known that he didn't want to be there, that was just going to be fading down the stretch. So you look at it and you go, "Okay, well, they got something in return, but then they had to flip it and give it away. They do have four first-round picks from that James Harden deal in early January. But if if you're the Rockets, you're just hoping that those are high picks. It's not necessarily because if the Nets play well, well what do those picks mean at all? Because if the, Knicks, if the Nets are where they're hoping to be for the next couple of years of being championship contenders, and they're looked at right now as the favorites— then what you're getting a 30th overall pick is that is that doing anything for you is that helping you jump start your franchise when you had your franchise guy leave no it's not doing anything so it's it, it's kind of tough if they could have had Karis LeVert who was a young piece that they could have built with Jared Allen young piece that they could have built with instead you get Avery Bradley who's Contract's going to expire at the end of the season, so that's and he's not a player you would build around. Kelly Olynyk, not a guy you're going to build around. So what? What did they? What did they really get? I I get it. It's not all their fault because James Harden did put them in a very tough situation. But that's all you got. That's all you couldn't make. At least take on Karis LeVert. Why? Why do you even make the move for Victor Oladipo? Because you were hoping that he would st- want to stick around. 
I mean, I, I, it's a tough one. Going into it, you knew that he had an, uh, he was an impending free agent. So why make the move for that guy? Why not get the guy who has two years left on his contract in Levert? The young player in Jared Allen who's still under contract. The Rockets in, uh, coming off a 20-game losing streak. You're, you're seeing that some, some trying times are in store for the Rockets. A franchise that was, for the most part, competing to try and be in the finals for the last eight years. And yeah, it's a, it's a drastic change. For Miami, it's a great move. You're able to get... You're able to get Victor Oladipo and and pair pair him with your squad, and you didn't have to give up too much in the process. And so you look at that, you go, okay, well, you didn't have to give up Tyler Hero or Duncan Robinson, and you added a hopefully ex- explosive guy. He's not the same explo- He doesn't have the same explosion that he had pre injuries. He can still shoot the ball, and he's not looked at to be the guy. He he's surrounded by a squad. And it's anticipated that since the Spurs bought out LaMarcus Aldridge, the Heat will be players for him. So you'd imagine that they'll add that after trading away Kelly Olynyk, He can slide into his spot. So you And they also were able to get Bailisha from the Sacramento Kings, who's a three-point shooter, Trevor Ariza and Andre Iguodala together. That's a nice defensive unit that's going to lock up a lot of people. And Bradley hasn't been able to play. He's been he's been hurt. He's been not out there for them. So now you're getting the guy who you hope can refine his form, but also you're not expecting him to be your franchise player carrying the squad for you. So good job by the Heat. I mean, this is what Pat Riley does. He's aggressive. He makes moves. He figures, hey, we have a shot. We were just in the finals. We have a squad. We know we can compete and get back there. And adding in Victor Oladipo, Bealisha, Trevor Ariza. Good job. And so the Heat, big winners on the day, I'd say. And they'll be interesting to watch now as, as they've rattled off uh, some wins in a row, although they're all, they are on a four-game losing streak. That has them sitting in that five spot. But again, they're, they're in a, the top of the six, so that's good for them. So good, good job for the Heat. So I'm going to take a quick break. We'll come back and recap a little bit more of some trades that also went down today. It was a big day. Lots of lots of trades happening. Woes and shams breaking things down. I do have a little funny stat that I want to get to about that. So stick around. We're going to take a quick break. Then we'll be right back. It's the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So lots of fun right now, just talking about all the trades that went down as it was the trade deadline day. Uh, It came and gone, lots of moves, lots and lots of moves happening from early in the AM. I mean, technically last night was when we got some Woj bomb going off about DeLon Wright being traded to Sacramento for Corey Joseph. But really early this AM is when it really kind of got going in full swing as the Magic started making moves happen, sending Vucevic to Chicago, Aaron Gordon to Denver, as well as Evan Fournier to Boston. 
Nuggets also acquired JaVale McGee to uh, provide that backup center role. So he goes back to the place that he started his career, if I'm not mistaken. I know he played in Denver. Uh, he he might have started with the Wizards, but let me quickly double check that because I do want to get that right. Yeah, he started with the Wizards and then went to the Nuggets. So he get JaVale does get to go back to a place where he played before, and he brings some now championship experience with him as he's won three titles, two with the Warriors and one with the Lakers last year, obviously. So lots of moves going down. Some minor moves that happened, the Golden State Warriors. No, they did not trade Kelly Oubre like many had wondered and talked about whether that would be going down. They traded Brad Wanamaker to the Charlotte Hornets for some cash. For Wanamaker, it was not the ideal season that he was hoping for when the Warriors signed him. And I know the Warriors were anticipating a little bit more from him. Um, I was a little surprised at how bad of a season he was having. It had it, been really tough for him, and he just he couldn't really couldn't really get it going for them. And I working for the Warriors, or at least uh, working at the station for the Warriors, and cutting their highlights. It he had lots of lots of chances to get some big buckets, and he just never seemed comfortable working with that second unit, and it, it just didn't quite work out for them. So both sides get to get a, a, a fresh start and just Warriors get to help of getting some more cash and being able to get kind of more comfortable away from the luxury tax. They also traded Marquise Chris to the San Antonio Spurs. Now, Chris, for what it's worth, is obviously injured, so he's not going to be playing for the Spurs. Warriors did send some cash that way, and again, Make being able to cut ties with Chris opens up some more spots for money and getting that luxury tax, tax bill dropped off because they are over it and they can get down and before they're uh, another repeater tax. But also, they add some money for buyout market. So they you got to figure that the Warriors will be. I don't want to say heavy players for some buyouts, but they didn't make the moves that you thought they might have at the deadline in trading Kelly Oubre for something big or that Minnesota pick for anything big. But with the buyout market happening, I mean, you look at a guy like Otto Porter Jr. if he gets bought out. Uh, Andre Drummond, I'd find hard to believe that the Warriors would be in on him simply because you wouldn't want to necessarily take away from James Wiseman's development and adding Drummond doesn't, It doesn't do a lot for me in in terms of helping the Warriors. So it'll be interesting to kind of watch the buyout market and see who gets, who's gone, who's where. Could a Terrence Ross happen? I I know I mentioned earlier how he was tweeting some funny things about the day and being the oldest guy in the locker room. Does he get bought out? Because obviously he could help. He could help any team that's looking for a playoff push or a, a contender for the title. So, so those are some of the minor moves. George Hill going to Philadelphia basically ended any chance that they were going to be in the Kyle Lowry sweepstakes as them, Miami, and the Lakers were all linked to Kyle Lowry, who ends up staying in Toronto, which to me was a little bit shocking because all we heard was that it was it could go either way, that he's getting traded. I thought he would be ending up in Miami. I thought that would be the move that they would make and help uh, that team. Obviously, they went with the Victor Oladipo route, and that worked out. But Lowry staying in Toronto, I mean, he's he is the gr- greatest Raptor in their history. Hey, he's one, he's been a part of the only title team, obviously winning that in 2019. And he's he's been the guy who's been there for years now and really embodies that that whole aspect of the Toronto Raptors. And so he now gets to go finish his ride with them. He'll be a free agent after the season. And what was tough for Lowry is he does have a big contract. So any deal you were going to make, you were going to have to make that match up with, with teams. And so that adds, that adds a layer to it of difficulty of not every team wants to add on a $34 million player. Certain teams like the title contenders, such as the Heat, Sixers, and Lakers, it was 
kind of trying to figure out, okay, well, what are we willing to give up for it? Again, Kyle Lowry's not a spring chicken. He's uh, 35. He just, it, it's actually his birthday today, and so he just turned 35. And you, you part of it is, okay, so if you go and trade for Kyle Lowry, who's to say it's not a rental? You, you, you aren't guaranteed that he's going to come back. You could trade away something that's valuable and bring him in, and yeah, maybe you win a title with him, and he helps give you that because he's still a good player. He's still productive and provi- provides a lot to the team. I mean, he's averaging 17 points a game and seven assists. So you would get a lot of value for it. That's that championship mentality also. He's been there, done that, been around the league. But if he leaves, if he if he goes and is a free agent and is just is gone anyways, then what did you really get? Yeah, you got you made let's say you make the playoffs or make the finals and you don't win you you got there but you lost it for nothing and and in the case of the Lakers it sounded like the thing that held them up from going and getting Lowry was that they didn't want to part with uh Talon uh Horton Tucker who has been a young piece coming off the bench for them who out of Iowa State has been really really solid people are really high on him He's long, athletic, can do a lot of things, and he seems to be a coveted piece. And they looked at it and went, well, we would rather roll with him and keep him moving forward as opposed to bringing in a potential rental because you don't know if Lowry would stay long term. And so for the Lakers, they decided to, to say no to the deal or they couldn't get it worked out with the Raptors and both agreed that it wasn't the move to make. And so... Lowry stays with the, Ro- with the with the Raptors, excuse me, used to be a Rocket, stays with the Raptors and will at least play out the rest of the season with them. We'll see what happens next year when he is a free agent. But the Raptors, it's interesting. I mean, this is a team who it, it hasn't been pretty this year at all. In their last 10 games, they're 1-9. and nine. Yeah, they got the win last night against the Denver Nuggets. As I'm recording this on March 25th, trade deadline day. But you look at it and you go, Raptors, again, that's another team that I look at like Boston. And it was, well, the Raptors have too much talent to be sitting at the 11 seed with an 18 and 26 record. I mean, they're three and a half games out, or excuse me, two and a half games out of just being in the nine spot. They're three games out of being in the eight spot. They're not even in the play in tournament at the moment. And this is a team that two years ago won the NBA championship. And obviously, they don't have Kawhi Leonard anymore, so that's a huge change. But again, this team with Nick Nurse at the helm, Lowry, Van Vliet, Siakam, they're too good. They're too talented to be that bad. And we we had a, and I know they put some tried to put some water on it, but Siakam blowing up at Nick Nurse, it, it's not. It seems like there's a little bit of dysfunction going on with Toronto which is unfortunate because that was a team that was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, for the Raptors for the longest time, 2019 was their first title in franchise history. And for a team where so much mediocrity and not being a cont- being able to get over that that hump for that stretch of when LeBron James was in the East – and the Raptors ran into him, it was over. Everyone knew, no matter if the Raptors were the one seed, like they were in 2018, it it just knew that LeBron was coming. It was over for the Raptors, and I think they felt that. And then finally he leaves the the East. They traded DeMar DeRozan and kind of broke up that pair of Lowry and DeRozan, which hurt, but they were able to get Kawhi Leonard, and they won their first championship, and so it was all worth it. Well, then obviously Kawhi leaves... And goes to the Clippers, and it left the Raptors in this spot of okay, well, well, what do they do now? Who are they? What 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 to expect? Was it all Kawhi Leonard, or was this team for real? And they were in the playoffs last year, got bounced by the Celtics in the Eastern semis, and so you went okay. Well, it wasn't just Kawhi because these guys also contributed. Siakam had a great great season. Fred Van Vliet was able to get paid this off season, and so coming into this season, you were expecting, okay, we should get uh, Raptors at least sitting in that top five, right in the East at the very least. Maybe not the NBA, but they can compete against and be at least ahead of 
the Heat maybe, the Hornets for sure, the Knicks, Hawks, all those teams, you would have thought if preseason putting out standings, if you were making it, you would probably lean in no particular particular order, Sixers, Bucks, Nets, Celtics, Raptors, Heat, in, in some combination there of a top six. And then it was the Raptors getting off to a horrendous start. It wasn't a great beginning for them and unfortunately for them they've had they have had to deal with the fact that they're not playing their home games in Toronto. Toronto's not letting them because of what's going on with coronavirus and that you don't want that much travel going back and forth and between uh going to Toronto and then having to play games in the states it just it wasn't working out so they play their games in Florida and you wonder has that been a factor for this team as to why it hasn't necessarily felt right. It hasn't been the right, uh, I don't want to say combination, but the right chemistry seems to be off. And they just, again, it's two years from a championship. And the only real big piece that is gone is Kawhi Leonard. They, I mean, they still have Siakam, Van Vliet, and Lowry. Norman Powell was still there. OG and Anobi still there. You don't have Marcus Saul anymore, which that has hurt them a bit. You don't have Serge Ibaka. And then Danny Green's not there, but you still have a lot of those key pieces, and it just seems they're out of whack. They maybe drink a little too much of their own Kool-Aid, thinking that they were maybe a little bit better than they were and that it wasn't just it wasn't just Kawhi. They I mean they were players all throughout. Fred Van Vliet was huge in the finals. Kyle Lowry made impact plays all over the place. Norman Powell hit some big shots. Siakam didn't have the greatest finals, but the playoff run to help them get there, he was a part of big time. It's why he got paid from them. And for the Raptors, it just seems it's been a a strange year. And for all of us, it's been a strange year. But for this their season it's been it's been off. And there's a reason why they were looking to trade maybe Kyle Lowry if if the right things popped up and obviously the right offer didn't pop up so they were willing to to stay with them. Now for their sake, you hope that they can move past the trade deadline and build off their win over the Nuggets last night and move towards getting into that playing tournament and then making a run at the playoffs. Because again, they I mean they sit in the eleven spot, so only one game, only one spot back of the play-in tournament, one and a half games back of it. And again, it's it's only a a four-game difference for them between being 11 and being six, so or even seven and, and being there. And so you look at it and you go, there, a lot of stuff can happen. We're, we're not at the same point of, well, there's so much time left in the season. Because no, it's, it's, it's now getting closer to crunch time and we got to figure it out and, and, and get going. But for the Raptors, there still is time to turn it around. So you hope that maybe maybe the Six can do it and they find their way and find their form. What you don't want to have, have happening is what was the reports of Siakam blowing up at Nick Nurse and saying some things that were crossing the line and going that route because that's just that's that's not good for anybody. That's not good for the franchise at all, having to choose between what you would look at as your your franchise player in Siakam and your head coach who Nick Nurse, you would imagine, isn't going anywhere. I mean, he's the coach that brought the first title to Toronto. He's one of the best coaches in the NBA, and having that title of being one of the best coaches in the NBA means you have to win, and there, there should be some, all right, well, we can't we can't accept being an 11 seed. Same thing that Boston can't accept being an eight seed. Those two, Brad Stevens and Nick Nurse, they're too good, and they have too much talent on their teams to be in these positions. So you look for them to be able to turn around and to figure it out and move forward, and maybe that's part of keeping Kyle Lowry and saying, you know what, we can still we can still make some stuff happen. We can still get into the playoffs, and once we're in the playoffs, we have talented guys. We have championship guys who we're in. Nobody wants to see us, and that, and that is the case if, if the Raptors get into the playoffs. If they're the seven seed and you, you're the two seed, that's the that's not a, that's not a seven seed you want to see. You want to see you want to see the Bulls. You you want to see the Knicks or the Pacers, 
the Raptors, they got championship DNA. And say what you want about whether championship DNA matters or not. It matters because they've been in pressure situations. They were in game six of the NBA Finals and clinched it on the other team's home court. Now you can say, oh, well, the Warriors were hurt that year. Well, it doesn't matter. They still got it done. They still had adversity and finished off and got the win and got the title. So for the Raptors, it's, hey, figure out what's the problem. Maybe move off of issues that were going on. You got rid of Norman Powell. Gary Trent Jr. comes in now and can provide a spark for you, and you see what he gives you. Maybe he comes off the bench still and is is is, is a huge energy spark for them, and, and it's just a change of things that they needed. And they're able to get right back into it and, and be a playoff team because they're not far off from it. And we've seen this team go deep into the playoffs. We've seen them win a title with these guys here. So for Nick Nurse and the Raptors, you hope that Maybe they figured some things out. Some other teams that maybe the Knicks were a little bit surprising that they make more of a move to try and bank off the fact that they're having their best season in years as they sit at the sixth seed right now. They did make a trade. They were involved in the three-team trade where George Hill went to the Sixers. And they kind of they got Terrence Ferguson. Uh, Vincent Poirier and a 2021 first, second round pick. So nothing really. Uh, they did move off Austin Rivers, who that's a guy, if I'm looking at the Thunder, who have a gajillion picks now, and they have 34 picks in the next seven years, which is pretty wild. I mean, Sam Presti just hoarding all those picks, and they're hoping that, hey, one day they'll they'll hit the lottery with them all. But... Austin Rivers, that's another guy who you look at and go, oh, is, is is he in the buyout market? Could he be available for teams to bring in and help add to their playoff run potentially? Because we've seen Austin Rivers in playoff games. We've seen him hit big shots. And it has been, you haven't seen him much this season for the Knicks. And I was a little surprised when he even signed with them in the offseason because it was one of those that I was expecting him to go to a contender. He's only played in 21 games for the Knicks this season, so I would I would look for him to be a guy who can end up getting bought out and going on the team and being productive because that's one of those guys. It's it's he's too good of a player to be on a a bad team and going nowhere because the Thunder they're not trying to win anything. It's especially with uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander getting hurt. And he's going to be out indefinitely. They're definitely not trying to win anything. Uh, they're sitting in thirteenth spot in thirteenth seed right now in the West. It, it's it's not a season where they're trying to win. It, it's just they, they, there's a reason they have thirty four picks is because they're building for the future. It's it's what Oklahoma City wants to do is build up, get a bunch of picks, and find a way to win later on, and hopefully have it hit the lottery like they once did with Kevin Durant. Russell Westbrook and James Harden and, and recreate that way because they're not a free agent destination. So it, it, it'll be interesting, interesting to see that buyout market should be, should be plentiful and going forward, it'll be, it's, it's like a second trade deadline almost. You, you, except there's no time limit on it. There's no countdown clock. Once guys bought, are bought out, it, it's, it happens pretty quickly that they sign with a new team, but it's still intriguing to watch and to monitor and see, all right, well, who's going to go where? You you still have Andre Drummond and the Cavs who are working on a buyout. LaMarcus Aldridge just got bought out and supposedly is probably going to go to Miami. Otto Porter Jr. watch out for. I'm thinking Austin Rivers you can watch out for. So it'll be interesting to see what goes on. Uh, but yeah, some, some moves that happened and some moves that didn't that were a little surprising. So I'm going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll kind of break down what... what What's going to happen now moving forward for the season with with these changes? Who should be looked at as a as a favorite and who who made the necessary improvements to better themselves and who should be looked at as a true contender? So stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to take a quick break. It's GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. 
Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. All right, welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Fun day of trades going down. The trade deadline's always a uh, a day to circle on the calendar and just be on your phone and on Twitter waiting for Woj and Shams to tweet out. And I actually came across a, a funny tweet that showed that uh, Woj, and, Woj and 11 by Woj, 6 by Shams, trade's broken today, 11 by Woj, 6 by Shams, and zero by other reporters combined. So it, it's pretty pretty interesting that those two guys have essentially have a monopoly on the sources. <laughs> In a way, it, 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 it's if Shams or Woj didn't tweet it, you, you wait and see about, okay, is, is this move actually happening? Did this move actually happen? What's going on? It's not official until Woj or Shams tweets it. And it's pretty funny. It gotten to that point, and especially on a day like today, and it's the same thing with like, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, and those guys in in the NFL is that you, you wait and see, and if it's reported by those guys, then you're pretty confident about it, and you can go, okay, like I I, I believe that move, and that and that's going down, and that's happened. But you have to be careful on days like these specifically, not to get caught by the fake woes or the fake shams or the fake Schefters of the of NFL news and. You have to watch out because it's the subtleness that goes into people, I guess, you're trolling and the accuracy of everything but, like, one letter in the name of a, of a Woj account is pretty hilarious. It's – I have been got before. It's it's happened to me. Uh, I, I got – I think it was an Adam Schefter one that got me one time. I haven't been gotten by the Woj too many times. It's it's just keeping keeping an eye on those, and you, you look for the little letter difference that's in there, and the the idea of just going and creating these accounts and and being a, a fake woes, you're a fake shams. It, it's it's super interesting and super funny, and that it, 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 no harm. It's it's nothing harmful. They're not doing anything mean or aggressive of being um, rude to people or angry or doing anything mean it's just a funny thing of oh you got applaud people of bringing freaking a, a fake trade out there so i i applaud people of bringing even more entertainment to a day like this and i i enjoy it and on social media you can go ahead and follow at gn gfsc underscore basketball to get some more tweets from our account we'll, we'll put up shows on there give you some questions maybe some what what are you guys thinking if you want to hear a certain topic Tweet at that account, or you can tweet at me also at Mr. Underscore Meowser. So feel free, like, subscribe, and give us all the feedback as possible. We always appreciate it. And I thank you for sticking around to this point and listening to me ramble on about trades or non-trades that happen today. I enjoy doing this all the time. So always thankful for the people who are listening and continue to listen and just subscribe and, and let's let me know what maybe another topic that you want me to talk about or get into and send send a DM, send whatever you got. So really appreciate it. So obviously I have been recapping the trades that went down. So now I kind of want to kind of want to move forward with the trade deadline has passed and obviously there will be the the buyout market going on, but that's a, a wait and see in itself and see when it happens, see when someone signs. But now that trades have happened and and things are uh, uh almost official because they still have to 
get the paperwork completed so people, GMs, coaches, and people cannot talk about the deals being done or else they will be fined, which I think is kind of dumb by the league. If it gets reported, why can they not talk about it? That makes no sense to me. But there's many things in the world of sports that don't make sense to me, and I could spend a lot of time talking about those, and maybe we will one day. A slow news day, which was not today as tons of trades happened and tons of things went down, but a slow news day, we'll get into some of those things that bother me because I can give you a list, and so we won't do that here because that's unnecessary. But so what team made the biggest improvements from the trade deadline? Who missed an opportunity to really improve themselves? I want to get into that a little bit. And I, I'll start here with the team that I think improved probably the most would have to be the Denver Nuggets. I do like adding Aaron Gordon, although it, I, I do question what, what do you do with Paul Millsap? Is he just going to come off the bench? That's uh, you, you can't really do anything with him besides having him on the team because you're not going to cut him and you're not going to reach a buyout with him. But adding Aaron Gordon to pair with uh, Joker, Jamal, Porter Jr., Mal- uh, I almost said Malik Beasley, he's not there anymore. Will Barton, excuse me, you, you look at them and you go, okay, well, that team got better. They also added JaVale McGee to help at the backup center who's going to provide some energy. You, he's always... He's always there to get people going, get put back dunk, can get you rebounds, can do some stuff for you, and you're just an energy guy. So he, we, we've seen him on championship teams. He's been a part of. So you're, you're looking at it and go, okay, so Denver improved, and they didn't have to really give up too much in the process of getting better. I mean, Hartenstein, it's, it, you're, that's, not, that's not a loss right there. Moving off of Gary Harris, uh, who – Last year had dealt with some injuries in the playoffs, so he wasn't there throughout, and you were able to get to the Western Conference Finals. This season, you're looking at it and you're going, okay, well, you want to get, obviously, Barton playing time. You have Compazzo. You have Michael Porter Jr. So Gary Harris, it was kind of a spot of, well, we can move off him and bring in a guy at maybe a position of need and, and putting uh, getting a new power forward and expanding that and creating depth there and moving Mills up to the bench. Jamichael Green, you wonder, is is he going to be affected by this? Then they brought him in from Los Angeles Clippers. And so you think, okay, well, they still, they've gotten deeper now. And so I, I like what the Nuggets did. They're, they're in a spot. Jokic is playing like an MVP. I know people have said that he should be the MVP favorite. I still have Dame, but I, I don't criticize or second guess anyone that chooses Joker. He's been phenomenal also this year and he he's a great player and he, he's one of he's in my eyes the best center in the NBA for sure. So I, I would I, I don't find it hard to believe that people will go and give him the MVP because again, he has had a great year. The reason the Nuggets are where they're at is because of him and what he's done. Jamal Murray has struggled a bit this year and Porter Jr. still you're still waiting to see him truly breakthrough I think he's I think he's the X factor and I'm glad that the Nuggets did not move him I I didn't hear too much about him possibly being shipped but you never know if it if you could get a a big time piece for him because he is a young guy who can do a lot he he just needs to work on defense probably a bit more and I think that's more just like learning and truly given effort because he can score from anywhere on the court. I he, he's the, I call him their biggest X factor. Because if you just get 15 points from him that's he can get those easily. He hits threes. He's a, he's and I I don't like to use comparisons too often. And I never want to put a comparison on a guy that's unfair or put in this idea of oh, well, that's who he has to be. But that's not what I want to do. But a, a, a skill set that I see that you could unlock from him is a Kevin Durant-ish because they are both ball handling, able to ball handle, can really, if truly necessary, block anything because of how tall and long they are. I mean, he's, what, 6'11". He might be listed a little bit shorter, but Porter's like 6'10". And he can ball handle, he can shoot the three. It's, It's one of those things you go, okay, well, 
he can do everything. You look at him, he's built kind of similar to Kevin Durant. Now, Kevin Durant is a much, much better defender and better overall player because, hell, Kevin Durant is, when healthy, a top three player. And there is a time where you can make the argument when he was on the Warriors, I mean, he was the best player in the NBA. No offense, LeBron, who my favorite player. But at that point, it, age and where they were at in their careers, Kevin Durant was the better player. Now, having to deal with the injuries, that's different. But Border Jr., if he can just figure out Figure his world out a little bit more. Maybe with the subtraction of Gary Harris, it opens up more shots for him to take. And it's really for him, it's, if he can figure out on defense, that's where you look at. You go, know, that's a true, true game-changing maneuver right there for him. And I, I hope so because I really do like Porter Jr. as a player. So I'd say the Nuggets made a, a big improvement. You look at... Aaron Gordon, that's going to be a, a, a huge get for them. I mean, he's they have not had a guy that athletic since who? I, I, I can't even think of anyone. J.R. Smith? Probably, eh. I mean, J.R. Smith at one point was a, a big dunking sensation. So, what? what eh, we'll go with that. Sure, we'll give J.R. Smith because I, I, I'm a fan of Henny Smith, even though... He was frustrating with the Cavs at times. But you look at the Nuggets, I think that they improved the most. I'm interested the most in Portland. Because Portland bringing in Norman Powell, you wonder, okay, so you moved off Gary Trent. And that, to me, was a a, a big move, which could work out for them. And it it may not. Norman's going to give you some different skill set. He will still be able to knock down the three like you hope. But also cut into the basket. Uh, going to try and lock up some guys and provide some other stuff for Dame and CJ because that's your backcourt. That's that; Those are your guys. That's your crew right there. And so going and getting another guy that's versi- – versatility is different than what Gary Trent was ju- doing because Gary Trent Jr. was – he's not the passer and not the slasher or cutter. He was a knockdown sh- – so I do really like what Portland and Denver has done from their standpoints, and we'll see. And, th- and those are two teams who are going to be battling each other. They're five and six, respectively, about a half-game difference between each other. So it's two big moves for two big teams who want to go deep into the playoffs. I'm, the Portland last year was the eighth seed and got in on being hot in the play-in tournament and stealing that bid from Memphis. Obviously, they've been dealing with injuries. Yusuf Nurkic is supposed to come back here shortly, so that's good for them. And Nuggets, who reached the Western Conference Finals last year, they they want to break through and get to the finals this year. So it's it's I like the moves, and I'm interested to see how it unfolds for the rest of the season. Uh, some teams that I was a little surprised maybe didn't make more moves or push for a a big time playoff push for a a big time. And playoff push is you'd have to go and and think all right well maybe the Clippers could have done more than just Rajon Rondo I don't know if that's necessarily the move that puts them up. the Warriors I thought they would I thought the Warriors maybe would do something of bringing in a guy again I'm I'm gonna look at them and think maybe I would say try and find some guys I would say. Otto Porter Jr. could fit for them, and that could be a route they go. So we'll see. I do like them keeping Kelly Oubre, even though you are taking the chance of the fact that he might leave next year. He might not be there. So it's it's intriguing to see what happens from there. And I also, I, I look at, and I thought, if you're the Jazz, you don't want to do anything to disrupt what you've already done. You're the number one seed right now. You have played really, really well. I thought maybe you, you add something else up. Uh, Maybe a backup center, if, if you couldn't get it, it's not a big deal, and it's not the end of the world. You don't want to ruin team chemistry too much. The Lakers, they stood pat. They they were in on Kyle Lowry, decided, I, I prefer not going for Kyle Lowry and keeping uh, THT and Dennis Schroeder. And again, I look for them, another team on the buyout market of going in, and if Drummond, when he gets bought out, I think that's the move that the Lakers need to go after. And that, if they get Drummond in fold, and obviously LeBron and AD get healthy, the Lakers are the my f- 
pick for as the favorites for the NBA championship. Even with what's going on in Brooklyn, and if those guys get fully healthy, Brooklyn, Los Angeles Lakers finals would be a crazy clash. I think whoever of those two teams, because I think it's going to come down to those two for Andre Drummond. Whichever one gets Drummond should be the favorite and most likely, I think, would win the title. I think that's the game-changing piece for this season, at least between those two teams. So we'll see what happens. Trade deadline has come and gone. Very exciting day. It was fun. Lots of uh, on my phone and on Twitter, keeping track of it and just monitoring what was happening all day. So thank you, Woj. Thank you, Shams. NBA Twitter popping off. Hey, teams are going crazy. So now let's see what happens the rest of the way. Teams are uh, basically set. There will be some more moves that happen. Guys get released. And so from there on, but... You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program